I said, then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? He said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And let's see what he said here. And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house, and thy house. I'm not just going to save you, but I'm going to save your house. He said unto him, sir, what must I do to be saved? He said, all you got to do is just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And thou shalt be saved. That's all you got to do today. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And your believing ain't no talking. Your believing is your doing. Your believing ain't no talking. Your believing is your doing. You got to do what he said. You got to repent of your sin. You got to be baptized in the name of Jesus. Let that blood of Jesus come into your life. He'll save you from all your sin. People don't like you living for God. They don't want you to be saved and sanctified. They don't want to hear nothing about no repentance. That's why you don't hear it. You don't hear it on the radio. You don't hear it on the TV. You don't hear it on Facebook. Ain't nobody talking about repentance. But you're going to have to repent of your sin if you want to go back with the Lord. No one in the Bible has ever been saved by faith alone. And what I'm saying, why I get so worked up about this thing is because these people come along and they say, it's just belief. It's just a belief. I just believe that I'm saved, therefore I am. Well, I believe that I'm a, a, a great flavored lollipop, therefore I must be. Where was faith alone? Where was faith even mentioned? It was works. Faith and works. And you need to repent. Right there. And don't let anybody tell you, from this crowd here, don't let anybody tell you, you're not that bad of a person. You don't have to repent. You don't have to have a new life. You don't have to change things. There's no change that's required with salvation. I mean, who wants to go to a physician and not come out with a changed life? You see? You're going to go to that physician expecting to have a changed life. And if you don't have a changed life from the physician, then you say the guy's a quack. He's no good. He's no different than anybody else. You have the witness in yourself when you get saved. My life changed. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Well, you must repent of your sin and confess your sin. And God is faithful and just to forgive you all of your unrighteousness. All is well. See that? All is well. You must let them know that God is in the blessing business. And all is well. Can somebody say that? All is well. When people kick you and they think you're down and out, show them that you trust in God. Huh? God will supply your every need. Can I get a witness? The Bible says in verse 30, and brought them out and said, Sons, what must I do to be saved? I want you to keep note of the words of the jailer. He uses two strong words. Number one, must. Number two, saved. When the word must is used, simply means the most important and the only requirement. No plan B. No option B, because he's asking them, Sirs, what must I? What must I? Is there anything that I must do so that I can go to heaven? Is there anything that I must do so that I can see the kingdom of God? Is there anything that I must do so that I don't go to hell? The word saved. He says, what must I do to be saved? 
The word saved simply means being delivered from the powers of eternal damnation, never going to hell again. You know, when we are doing our soul winning, sometimes when we ask people what they understand by the word saved, people will give you different definitions. Others will tell you to be saved is to dress well. To be saved is to stop smoking. To be saved is to be a good person. To be saved is to pray every day. But brothers and sisters, even without referring to the scriptures, the word saved comes from the word save. It's an action. And only a powerful personality, a powerful subject, a powerful power can save you where you are helpless. Say for example, if, if I was in my house, and my house was on fire, at that point in time I cannot deliver myself. I am in risk of dying. What will happen unto me? I will begin screaming, calling for help. And whoever will come and secure me out of that trouble will be called my savior with regards to that situation. This man is asking Paul and Silas, what must I do to be saved? What is the requirement? The must requirement that I'm supposed to do so that I never go to hell. So if you are getting me right, this is the point. This is a man who is asking a question to Paul and Silas because he does not want go to go he does not want to go to hell because of his sins. Number 1, in that question he realizes that he is in danger of going to hell. You know when you begin to ask someone, what must I do to, to be saved? What must I do to go to heaven? It begins from you being informed that hey, you are in danger. The probability the chances of you going to hell are high. And why do people go to hell? Because of unbelieving, because of their sins. The Bible says, go down to Proverbs 24. Brothers, I want you to understand one thing. That every sin that you have ever committed in your life was, was able to take you to hell. And if you are here and you are not saved, any sin that you have ever committed in your life is enough to take you to hell. It's not about a big sin. It's not about a small sin. No. Any sin that you've ever committed in your life and you are still in that condition, you have not come to a point of asking Paul and Silas, what must I do to be saved? You have not come to a point of agreeing to speak to our soul winners, agreeing to speak to Pastor Paul, agreeing to look out for the truth. That sin is just enough to take you to hell. The Bible says in Proverbs 24 verses 9, the thought of foolishness is sin and the scorner is an abomination to, man, to men. The Bible says even having a thought of foolishness, you have committed sin. That is something even the unbelievers will tell you it is hard to avoid. Because you know what? It is possible you can avoid murdering. You can avoid being a witch. You can avoid going for sorcery. You can avoid going for adultery. But when it comes to matters, mind and thoughts, the Bible says, you know what? Anytime you have a foolish thought, you have committed sin against God. Then the question is, how then can you even come to a point of considering yourself to be a good person to go to heaven when you have a sin troubling you every day, which is the sin of the mind? This man is asking Paul and Silas, what must I do to be saved? Go to Romans chapter 3. Brothers, all of us have committed sin and no one can ever claim that he or she is perfect before the Lord. All of us. And you know, anyone who thinks to say, I have not committed sin, either that guy is ignorant, he does not know what he's saying, or he's so proudful. Because you know what? God in his word, he has proven, and I believe in that word, and I agree with God that all of us have committed sin, and there's no unrighteous, 
no one perfect. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3 verses 10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no not one. The word righteous can also be interpreted as perfect. There's no one perfect in the eyes of God. There's no one righteous in the eyes of God. There's no one who is doing good in the eyes of God. There's no one who is perfect in the eyes of God. The Bible says, verses 11, there's none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Look down to verses 23. The Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. When God says all, we should know that we are in that category. Amen? I don't care whether people go to church regularly. I don't care whether people dress white. I don't care whether people sleep in the church. The Bible says in the eyes of the Lord, we have all sinned. There's no one good in the eyes of the Lord. Therefore, you can never measure, you know, even come to a point of the scaling of God, even to be good, because God has already concluded, and God has finalized on that subject, saying, you, me, our parents, our cousins, everybody that we know, and if, even the people that we do not know, the Bible says, all of us have sinned. So do we have a perfect person in the eyes of the Lord? We don't have. We don't have. The Bible says in Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus, through Christ, through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Bible says because of our sin, because of having an evil thought, because of lying, because of all the sins that we have committed, the Bible says the salary, the payment, that which we have to receive from the hand of God is nothing good but going to hell. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. I want you to go to Revelation 21 so that I can prove unto you that this is not a physical death because even believers will die a physical death and you know what? Even unbelievers will die a physical death but here is speaking about the second death. Revelation 21 verse 7 the Bible says, mark this the Bible says, he that overcometh shall inherit all things and I will be his God and, I sh and, he, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and homongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. Keep note of this which is the second death. Now keep you know considering chapter 21 of Revelation because this is also a scripture whereby the workspace salvation is like using. I remember many years ago while in Kakamega when doing soul winning, a guy after I had preached unto him matter salvation which is of faith alone without works, he quickly went to Revelation chapter 21 and ref, you know showed me verses 8 that says the fearful, the unbelieving, abominable, murderers, homeowners, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And this guy was saying, if you continue lying, you go to hell. If you continue committing adultery, you'll go to hell. If you do any sin, you go to hell. But look, verse 7 is very important. Because the Bible says, he that overcometh. So we have people that are called overcomers contrasted against the people in verses 8 who are fearful, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, homongers, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars. So the question is, who is an overcomer? Go down to 1 John chapter 5. So this means if you do not overcome, the sins including that the sins that we have seen in Revelation 21 including lying will see you go to hell if you do not overcome and the goal of this sermon is to speak unto you brother sister who is still doubting and not sure and even not willing to come to the light that if you be there and you have not overcome will you please consider to overcome today because you are at the right place. We don't always preach salvation messages here. 
We preach them every week, every Tuesday, every Saturday, outside there. But I have a feeling that they have to be preached here today again. Who is an overcomer? First John chapter 5 verses 4. The Bible says, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world. Even our faith. The Bible says it is our faith which overcometh the world. Verses 5. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. How do you overcome the world? By believing that Jesus is the Son of God.